We are a Kenyan NGO that has existed for about 10 years and um, we work towards eradication of human trafficking in Kenya, in East Africa and we are hoping the world. It's a big dream but um, we think we can start it or we can, actually we can contribute to it because there are a lot of other people who are doing this good work. At heart we use the 4P approach um, to counter trafficking work which is prevention, protection, prosecution, and policy and partnership. So policy and partnership is one. Um, we have departments that tackle each of these four Ps. So the prevention team runs workshops and seminars to create awareness on the scourge of human trafficking and also provide community members with recourse. If they think a friend or family has been trafficked or they know of a story of someone who has been trafficked, um, we give them access to our helpline, which is widely shared, and they can call into the helpline and report the case and share whatever information they know, and we try and see how we can support and how we can help. The second team is the protection team, and the protection team offers protection services and support services to victims of trafficking. So that includes psychosocial support, counseling and therapy, uh, medical support, basic needs support like food, shelter and clothing. Um, and then the third department is the prosecution department, which is the department I'm in. And our role is to assist victims to navigate the legal system in Kenya. So we support them if they want to go through and participate in the trial, or if they don't want to go through and participate in the trial, that's also their right. So we tell them their options, give them legal advice and support them in whatever decision they decide to make. Finally, we have the policy and partnership department, which works on research and looking into various questions around trafficking in Kenya and seeing how we can develop policies and, advoc and carry out advocacy rather that is responsive to the situation that we have on the ground. So with that short introduction to HEART and what we do, I'd like to just jump in really quickly. Uh, first, I'd like to really thank uh, the Refugee Law Project for this opportunity to share our work with you and our challenges and our outlooks. Um, so I'll jump right into human trafficking from a Kenyan context, which is what I've been tasked with speaking about today. So the basis of counter-trafficking work in Kenya, like everything, is our constitution, which was promulgated in 2010. Um, the specific law that actually addresses counter-trafficking is the Counter-Trafficking in Persons Act, which was also passed in 2010. And um, this act borrows heavily from the Palermo Protocol, which is a protocol to the United Nations Convention on Trans-Organized Crime. I've summarized the name, it has a very long name. So... The Palermo Protocol defines trafficking and defines state obligations when it comes to trafficking. And for the most part, Kenya heavily borrowed that and we created our counter-trafficking in persons law. Um, that has had both good and bad uh, consequences. Uh, good in that we have a definition of trafficking and we have a clear law that states what the country, uh, what the government, sorry, is supposed to do and um, what are their obligations to victims, what are their obligations to other countries, what are their obligations in the large international community that we live in. The Act, however, has some limitations. For example, the definition of trafficking doesn't really take into consideration some of the local um, ways in which traffic ma trafficking manifests. For instance, in Kenya, there's a practice of foreigners, uh, persons from Europe, and the United States coming to Kenya to set up orphanages. And in these orphanages, what they do is they go around to the surrounding communities and they tell them that they have this school for children or a home for children. And they're willing to take the children from these communities with the promise of giving them an education, giving them access to basic needs, and basically giving them opportunities. Um, this is largely problematic because children belong in families for the most part and not in homes or orphanages and usually it's done to exploit the poverty and the desperation of these families and get them to give up their children. Also to an extent some of these families are paid to give up their children and now what happens is these children are put in these orphanages that have absolutely no oversight. 
um, there's no one to check and make sure that these children are going to school, they're receiving medical needs, they are being kept safe. So for instance, this year, there was a conviction in the United States of a man called Doe who came to Western Kenya, set up an orphanage and um, used that orphanage to access children who he proceeded to violate. So he was convicted for the violation of some of these children. And that's the issue that we have here. So if you think about it, that's trafficking in that these children are being transported, transported and harbored by this man for the purpose of exploitation because he's starting this orphanage to as a way to get money from his fellow Americans or Europeans in the name of helping African children. So, you know, videos are shot with these children and there's their GoFundMe campaigns and whatever. And the whole thing is designed to use these children as props for donations so that these people can enrich themselves. And the children have absolutely no protection. So that is trafficking because that is exploitation and they're being harbored for the purpose of exploitation. But the law doesn't really consider that trafficking because I guess in a larger context or the more international context, this is not how trafficking commonly manifests. Um, so we have those shortcomings in terms of the law. Another shortcoming that is legal, particularly, is um, the lack of regulations to operationalize the act. So the act was passed 10 years ago, and we still don't have regulations that now give guidance to the specific government bodies on how they're supposed to perform their duties under the act. So now there's a kind of laissez-faire way that things are being done and you know it all depends on who you know will um how your case will be handled has like there's no standard of care there's no minimum standard when it comes to shelter when it comes to medical care there's nothing because of the lack of these regulations because the act recognizes that these are rights that victims have but the regulations to actually operationalize this do not exist um the third issue we have is non-implementation of the law. So in a, aside from not having regulations, even what's there, there's little effort that has been put in to actually help victims, to support them. We don't have government shelters, for, intra, for instance. Uh, shelters are run by CSOs like HART and um, religious organizations, and the government actually has an obligation to provide shelter to vulnerable groups, including victims of trafficking, but that hasn't happened. Uh, medical care. We don't have a system through which victims of trafficking can access medical care and affordable medical care rather. So, and you know, the problem with victims of trafficking is usually they are economically down on their luck. So you can't expect them to go to a private hospital because chances are they haven't been paid. And also they've been brought here for exploitation. They don't have the freedom to walk around or they've been taken from here with the purpose of exploitation. So they don't have the freedom to, you know, go looking for hospitals or whatever it is. Um, so that's one problem, and that's the second problem, actually. A third problem is the wrong implementation of the law. So where the law is actually being implemented, it's not being implemented with a rights-based approach or with... Actually, yeah, the biggest problem is the lack of a rights-based approach. So for instance, the Counter-Trafficking in Persons Act recognizes the right to privacy for victims. And this is expressly stated in the Act. But now, unfortunately... Media houses have been known to be present at rescues and they take photos and they, yes, they cover the rescue and there's no guideline on how they can ethically tell the stories of these victims. So they tell their stories sometimes without hiding their faces. Um, they tell their stories sometimes embellishing here and there, I guess, for readership or whatever reason they do it so it's not ethically told and it's not told in a way that empowers the victim or allows the victim to be an active participant in the telling of their own stories and police don't stop them from showing up at raids so there are problems like that there's also issues of deporting victims of trafficking rather than repatriating them which are two very different processes uh, that look at you two in two very different ways because you're deported as someone who has broken the law or as someone who, you know, is here voluntarily without papers or is abroad voluntarily without papers, which is not the case for many victims. They've actually been taken to these countries. They've been brought to Kenya. They've been taken to the Middle East. Their documents have been taken away from them by their traffickers. And, you know, so they don't not have a passport because they don't want to. It's because it's been taken from them. So they're not actually 
criminals and they should not be penalized for that. They should be assisted through that. Um, but that doesn't happen. So you end up with deportation of victims. And then you have forcing victims to testify in their criminal cases. All victims have a right to choose whether or not to testify. And this right should be respected by state and non-state actors. That does not happen. So victims are usually told if they want the government to help them, they should help the government and, you know, testify. And very little thought is given to how do we ensure these people are safe as they're waiting to testify? How do we ensure these people are safe after they testify? And, you know, just protection of victims and looking at it from a victim-centered and a trauma-informed point of view rather than, you know, we need prosecution for prosecution's sake. Not really, because the purpose of prosecution is to get justice. And the person who needs justice is the victim. So if getting prosecution, in getting prosecution, you harm the victim, what have you achieved? You know, those are the questions that we need to ask ourselves. Now, like all things, COVID has come to make an already horrible situation a lot worse. So now we have added issues of countries locking down their airspaces and then victims are stranded in their countries of exploitation. Even though you're rescued, where are you going? Um, you can't go home, you can't go to a shelter because shelters are being closed, you can't, there's no one to ho house you, so now you're depending on good Samaritans, which puts you in a very vulnerable place as a victim, and there are no measures that the Kenyan government has put in place to address an issue like this. Another one is re requiring victims to take COVID tests before they come in, or come back home rather or before they leave the country. And the question is, this is someone who was brought to this country for exploitation. Where are they going to find money to get a COVID test done? And currently the COVID tests count, cost about 6,000, 7,000 Kenya shillings, which is about 70 US dollars. Where are you going to find that money as a victim of trafficking? So these are some things that haven't been thought about. And yes, I understand the need for these measures and why they're important in this global pandemic that we're currently trying to live through. But how can we make these measures responsive to COVID and responsive to victims of trafficking at the same time? Because it can be done if they just sit down to think about it. So another thing is offering victims access to services like shelter or quarantine. Because now, okay, assuming a victim comes home, it's great that they're home, but their family won't take them in because their family is worried they might have COVID and they cannot afford to have it spread within the home. So where will this victim go? There are no state shelters to take in this victim. There's nowhere this victim can get, get safe accommodation. And that's a really big issue. So those are some of the things that we're looking at and some of the challenges that we're facing. Uh, I'm grateful to all of you for listening to my short presentation and I hope you enjoy the rest of the seminar.